During the doomed Project Prometheus, Dr. Charlie Holloway ingests a sample of chemical A0-3959X.9115, which leads to a swift genetic breakdown within his entire body. He is horrifically mutated, and he soon meets a painful and cruel demise, not as a result of the mutation, but at the hands of Meredith Vickers. She carries out his fiery execution after recognizing the threat of contamination that he poses. After his initial contact with the pathogen, but before any signs of mutation became apparent, Holloway had a sexual encounter with his wife, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, and it is later discovered that as a result of this encounter, Shaw became pregnant. This came as a shock to her, as she believed she was unable to carry children and simply couldn't get pregnant. It was all the more shocking and terrifying as the pregnancy progressed at a rapid, unnatural speed, and the eventual realization that the life growing inside of her was anything but human. The creature inside of Shaw, the trilobite, is extracted via emergency surgery in Peter Whelan's med pod and continues to grow rapidly until the ending moments of the film. At which point, this trilobite resembles what can be best described as a giant facehugger, which attacks and impregnates an engineer. Much like a facehugger, the trilobite presumably dies after fulfilling its purpose of delivering its alien embryo. The final result, the creature that rips its way from the dead body of the engineer, is the Deacon, sometimes referred to as the Ultramorph. It was born on New Year's Day in the year of our Lord, 2094. In the chronology of the Alien series, this is the first glimpse we see of a creature closely resembling the Xenomorph XX-121, with similar features, but enough differences in its appearance that we can best attribute to not only the fact of it being born from an engineer host, but the delivery method of the embryo itself. Requiring an infected human host to impregnate a healthy, viable human host to carry out the gestation of yet another embryo carrier, which is then able to impregnate an engineer, is a long, drawn-out genetic road on the destination to the resulting deacon. Too many steps and too many variables would hinder a species' ability to propagate in the much more efficient and straightforward way as the XX121 xenomorph. The life cycle was refined in the form of egg sacs found on Planet 4 by the Covenant's crew. The pods emitted airborne moats, which could enter a host, infect it, and grow the embryo of the Neomorph, a very similar creature to the Deacon with a more effective method of procreation. You may recall, earlier concept designs explored for the Deacon in Prometheus very much resembled the Neomorph as seen in Alien Covenant. Because of placing this creature aside in favor of the Neomorph for the follow-up film, and because it's seen only once and only very briefly, the Deacon remains one of the more mysterious inhabitants of the alien universe. Even the Wayland yutani report, a very detailed exploration of the universe and all of the creatures and technology found within, keeps decidedly mum on the topic. Working as an in-universe report covering all of the company's encounters with the Xenomorph, the rundown of Project Prometheus reveals very little about this form of the alien, stating, Information regarding this creature, sometimes referred to as the Deacon, requires a security clearance above the rating of this report. There are also teases of hypotheses from company scientists, but unfortunately these are redacted. In reality, this is mostly due to the fact that the Wailing Jutani report was published in between the release of Prometheus and the beginning of production on Alien Covenant. And at this point, Ridley Scott was unsure if he'd include the Deacon in the new film. Ultimately, he favored the use of the Neomorph, so much of the Deacon's full-grown appearance, behavior, abilities, and purpose in the grander scheme of things is left to speculation of fans. One of the burning questions regarding the Deacon is whether or not the engineers had previously encountered such a creature in their own experiments. The mural seen in the LV-223 temple is a strong indicator that this is the case. Why a mural is dedicated to the beast is another point of speculation. One theory is that it is a figure of worship to the engineers. It represents a method of reproduction beyond even their abilities, and they revere it like a god of life and death. Another theory is that it's not an altar of worship, but a warning presented in a similar spirit as the hieroglyphics warning of the alien threat in Dan O'Bannon's earlier screenplay for the original film. If it is a warning, and if a key ingredient in the development of this deacon creature is the use of a human being as the vessel to grow the embryo delivery parasite, then this could explain just why the engineers are so keen on destroying Earth. If they wipe out all life on the planet, then the worst case scenario is avoided. 
In order to propagate the species, much like the alien, either being hermaphroditic or ideally with a queen to lay eggs, the deacon would need hosts to ensure its ongoing survival. This puts the creatures seen at the end of Prometheus at a seeming disadvantage, as there is no other life on LV-223. We can assume, given what we know of the Xenomorph XX121's life cycle, the creature would eventually simply die, and there would be no other Deacon Xenomorphs to follow. The Fire and Stone comic series, which covers an arc over a Prometheus, Aliens, Aliens vs. Predator, and Predator storyline, suggests differently. Prometheus Fire and Stone features a recovery team that lands on LV-223 to investigate the fate of the Prometheus crew, and as the story unfolds, they encounter a wide variety of life on the planetoid. In fact, as this comic series was originally written, the team was originally meant to face off against a horde of the Deacon creatures. Concept art was created for the story, featuring the Deacon in a more infantile stage as seen at the end of Prometheus, and scale adjustments to give an idea of what the creature would look like once fully grown. Ultimately, this concept was scrapped, and the aliens featured in this story ended up with a design matching more of the well-known classic version of the Xenomorph. This was likely because Ridley Scott was still keeping the Deacon design at bay, and featuring it in the comics would have intruded on the possible plans for the yet-developed Prometheus sequel. We do, however, see a shark creature in the comic that very closely resembles the Deacon, which is appropriate enough, as the inner jaw of the Deacon was inspired not by the original Xenomorph, but by the jaws of a goblin shark. While we don't actually see the Deacon in the comics, there has been a fairly prominent fan theory that the conclusion of the story in Predator, Fire and Stone holds a clue to the creature's fate. Survivors of this story pick up on a beacon emitting from a nearby mountain that they believe to be coming from Wayland's ship and believe to be human in origin. When drilling into the mountain, acid blood erupts from what appears to be the vein of a living being. When observing the inside caverns of the mountain, a character observes it's alive. It's a being. It must have been on Wayland's ship, and now it's grown up around it. An outlandish concept for sure, but it makes enough sense within the context of the story as a whole. The Fire and Stone series is quite interesting, and connects the worlds of Scott's prequel and the comics pretty nicely, and is worth exploring more on the channel, so comment below if that's something you'd like to see. And comment below if you think the Deacon still may have a place for further exploration in the extended universe. It's been nearly a decade now since the release of Prometheus, and we haven't seen the creature much further. Do you think Alien Covenant may have worked with its inclusion, or are you happy with the inclusion of the Neomorph instead? Personally, if given the choice, I would say I prefer the Neomorph. I think it contrasts better to the final stage of the Xenomorph and is a different enough design to stand on its own uniquely. Compare that to the Deacon, which maybe looks a little too similar to the double X121 version. But that's just my opinion, and I would love to hear what you think, and if we may ever see this particular version of the Alien ever again. With fresh new takes soon to come from Marvel Comics, this could be something that the future holds. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. I really appreciate it, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. A very, very special thanks goes out to Will and Jitani Executives, Emirik, Mark Fox, and in the Ellen Ripley tier of excellence, Lady Am. My thanks also goes out to the Hive Queens, Ronnie Jensen, Alice Zane, and Jackson Roche, all part of the Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.